to uh, Sunday morning service with Bethel Church. Uh, wherever you live, whatever the time is, it is where you're watching. We want to welcome you to the Christmas edition of Bethel Church here in Taylorsville, Kentucky. This morning we will be in <clears throat> looking at what is Christmas all about. So uh, if you would, uh, we will be turning first of all to Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, we will be in Isaiah chapter 6. And um, we will, all right, thank you, Brother Don. Uh, we will uh, be looking at Isaiah chapter 6. We want to find out uh, where did this Jesus come from? Uh, who is he? Did he just pop on the scene? <coughs> who is Jesus? What is Christmas all about? <coughs> Why are we celebrating Christmas here in uh, Taylorsville, Kentucky at Bethel Church? Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The one who, <clears throat> the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. This is God's word. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for everyone listening, wherever in the world and whatever time it is. I pray right now, everyone listening, by the, the omniscience of the living Christ and by the authority of Christ, I command every demonic spirit to be broken and crushed. I pray for individuals listening right now to be delivered by the Spirit of God and that this leads to freedom in Christ and forgiveness. Spirit of God, be operative in the listeners' lives today as they hear this message and may the lost embrace and believe in Jesus today. Save them in the midst of hearing this word today. Block all interference as they listen. In the name of Jesus we ask for this message to have an impact around the globe. Bless the hearers today, Lord. May we understand the true message of the Christmas story. May the Holy Spirit reveal the evidence needed for many to come to saving faith in Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray. First of all, we're, gonna, we're looking at Jesus in heaven. Why in the world did we start in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7? We look at, as Isaiah saw Jesus in heaven. First of all, we have the upward look of Isaiah. He sees the pre-incarnate Son of God sitting on the right hand of the Father. John 12, 41 says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. He saw the glory of Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. Isaiah could only have seen the Son, not the divine essence. John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is the, as, at the Father's side, he has made him known. Isaiah mentions the robes, the temple, the seraphim, but not the form of God himself. Amen? 
he sees the pure holiness of God the Father. He sees the pure holiness of God the Son. He sees the whole, the pure holiness of God the Holy Spirit. Isaiah recognized that he was undone. That's when he had an upward, uh, an inward look. We all need to have an inward look and look at our own lives and evaluate where we are with the Lord Jesus Christ. What about our worship? Who is most important to you this morning, Sunday morning, or December the 23rd, 2018? Who is the most important to you this morning? What did you have on the throne of your heart this morning? Who is on the throne of your heart? Have you put Jesus first today? Is Jesus on the throne of your heart? Isaiah recognized that he was undone. What about you? Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. The same effect was produced on others by the presence of God. Gideon sees Jesus and worships. In Judges 6, 22 through 24, Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ. Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, this is Jesus Christ. He recognizes who he is seeing by the threshing floor as being the Lord God. He, he addresses him, Alas, O Lord God, he sees Jesus Christ. For now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face, but the Lord said to him, <clears throat> Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. To this day it stands at Orpha, which belongs to the Alberzites. Jonas saw Jesus. And Manoah and his wife, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. That's Judges thirteen twenty-two through 23. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands, or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, has appeared already now to Gideon. He's appeared to uh, Manoah and his wife. Job sees God and despises himself. Job 42, verses 5 and 6, I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. When we see Jesus Christ for who he is, we have no choice but to see the sinfulness inside of ourself. The, the light, the brilliance of Jesus Christ exposes us, and it should cause us to fall on our face. It should call us to be repentant. It should call us to look to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. This is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, the one the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament is building a case trying to reveal to us. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So we are looking at the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has been with God ever since God, there was no beginning. Jesus Christ has always been the Son of God. He did not become the Son of God when he was born in a manger or born in a cave. <clears throat> Peter sees his sinfulness in Luke chapter 5 and verse number 8. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. John the Revelator's response when he sees Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. 
When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of death and hell. Jesus Christ has the keys of death and hell. We need to take note of that. We need to take note of the fact that fear not him who can kill the body, but fear him who is able to kill both soul and body and cast the body into hell fire. That, that is Jesus Christ, the judge of the world. Jesus Christ came as a lowly savior in, the, in, a, in a stable, in a cave. But he's coming back to rule and reign with a rod of iron. And every believer will meet Jesus Christ one day at the judgment seat of Christ, and Jesus Christ will be the judge of all of those who are saved. He will judge our works to be of what sort they are, to see whether they are lasting or to see whether they burn up. Our works will be tried with fire. We who are Christians, this baby who was pre-incarnate Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, the one who was born of a virgin, in the New Testament, and the one who's coming back to rule and reign, the one who has kind of stand and judged all of those who profess the name of Jesus Christ, all of the saved. We hear much today, and you can find so much on YouTube today about all the different ideas of what's going to happen in the future The future is this, every saved person, everyone who has believed on Jesus Christ, everyone who has trusted Jesus as their personal Savior will be going to heaven when they die or in the rapture. The point is this, the Bible says to be absent from the Lord is to be present with God. Our soul... <coughs> will be going to heaven. Our body will stay wherever it is until Jesus comes back in the rapture. Those of us who are alive and remain shall not prevent those who are asleep. In other words, those who are asleep will rise from the graves first, and then the, those of us who have not died yet will raise to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It is this Jesus who is going to judge us, this Jesus who is coming to get the saved on earth, and they will be uh, spending eternity with heaven. And this Jesus will be the one who comes back to rule with a rod of iron. It's this Jesus, this pre-incarnate Jesus of the Old Testament will be a part of, and parcel of the, he will be the one who drives the rapture. He will be the one who drives the judgment seat of Christ. He will be the one who drives the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment at the end of the thousand year reign will be the judgment when the Christians and our non Christians stand before Jesus and they will be judged about what they did with Jesus. Then we have the outward look. Isaiah 6, 8, and Isaiah says, And I heard the voice of him saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Isaiah's commission, contrary to what most preachers preach, was that he was to supposed to keep people from seeing at this time. He was supposed to have a message that would prevent people from being saved. Hmm. Nobody ever preaches that. <clears throat> Isaiah's commission then was to keep people from seeing. Our commission is Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. 
and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Our commission is to free the prisoners from the prison house. Unlock people who are blind and help them to see. Isaiah spoke of this. In uh, about Isaiah chapter 42, he said, open the prison doors and let the prisoners out. Help those who are blind to see. That's God's heart. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. As we go to make disciples, we are to have on the armor of God. We have come to a point of time in our country and I, I don't know how many have noticed this, but things are not the way they used to be. We have come to an era that we are fighting the unseen world, and that world has multiplied by the exponentially in the last few years. Since about 2000, that, that multiplication has gone crazy. It started a long time ago, and it's getting worse and worse. <clears throat> Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 says, Finally, finally, Christians, finally, Christians, Paul is saying, finally, put on the whole armor of God. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Look, the devil is active and he's prowling about seeking who he may dis dis devour. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I bet you thought that when you got mad at somebody, you were getting mad at somebody else. Well, we don't. It's not somebody else that we're mad at. It's other people who like some kind of a spirit that they let come into their life and they like it and they let it control their life. That's what we're mad at. We're not mad at flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. We need to be busy winning people to Christ today. Our commission, we have our marching orders. Our marching order is to go and make disciples of everyone, not just win people to Christ. Our commission is to win people to Christ and then take them under our arm. The first thing that we ought to be teaching new disciples to Christ is to put on the armor of God. We get people saved and we just leave them hanging. Man, we, we're so proud of ourselves. We've won somebody to Christ. We've let the, the, the we've witnessed to somebody. The Spirit of the Lord has come into their life, and they've trusted in Jesus Christ. And we walk away and never see them again. The very first thing we should do is teach others to put on the armor of God. In the Gospel of John, we see the heavens opened and the internal sun descending from above taking his place in the womb of the virgin, God and man in one blessed, glorious person. 
the eternal Son manifest in the flesh. John says in the Gospel of John, Behold your God. His gospel was written to establish the truth of the divinity and the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. With the first 12 chapters, we have the divine Son presented to the world in, the, in character in which he could appeal to the world of sinners. He shall note, or we shall note those various characteristics as we go on today. Jesus in the world. John 1, 1, in the beginning was God, or excuse me, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that is one of the names for Jesus Christ. He is the Word. Jesus Christ is the eternal Word. He existed in the beginning, not because he had a beginning as a creature, but because he is eternal. He is God, and he was with God. Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus Christ, as I've already said, has always been the Son of God. Jesus Christ never had a beginning. Jesus Christ was not an afterthought. God said, I'll, man has messed up. I'm going to send Jesus down to save them, to die for them, to pay for their sin. Jesus Christ is not an afterthought. Jesus Christ has been in existence all along. There, God never had a beginning. Jesus never had a beginning. The Holy Spirit of God never had a beginning. They have always been. There is no beginning. Mind cannot understand something not having a beginning. We all had a beginning. One day, a sperm reached an egg. We don't really think about what that is. We have been a part of the creation process. When that egg and that sperm come together, and that sperm penetrates that egg, a whole new human life begins. A whole new human life begins. And we have been a part of that process. What a glorious thing. What is, it's a glorious thing. Just John eight fifty eight, Jesus said, "Before Abraham was, I am." Jesus is the creative word. There is certainly a parallel between John one one and Genesis one one, the new creation and the old creation. God created the world through His word, and God said, "Let there be," for He spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast, and. And God created all things through Jesus Christ, which means that Jesus Christ is not a created being. He is eternal God. The verb was made perfect tense in the Greek, which means a compact act. Creation is finished. Jesus is the incarnate word. He is incarnate. He has appeared. It's him that Christmas is about. We have we come to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Christmas is not about Christmas presents. It's not about a Christmas tree. It's not about Christmas lights. It's not about ornaments. It's really not about eating with each other and having Christmas parties and having gifts and exchanging gifts. Christmas is about the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. We look at Jesus in the Old Testament. In Isaiah, in chapter 6, he saw the incarnate Christ at the right hand of God. In John 1, we see that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God John reveals Jesus Christ as the incarnate, the incarnate One. He was not a phantom or a spirit. He ministered on earth. 
nor was his body a mere illusion. John and the other disciples each had a personal experience that convinced them of the reality of Jesus Christ being the Savior of the world. Have you ever just met somebody and that you just know that you know? Do you not know that Jesus Christ is revealed in other people? And the spirit of darkness is also revealed in other people? Have you not heard? Have you not understood? Do you not know that when you meet a drug addict, <clears throat> According to the Word of God, according to the Spirit of God, it should be immediately recognizable to us that we have met a drug addict. I was out the other day, and I walked into the Kroger. When I went through the front door, there was a gentleman standing to my left. One look, the Spirit of God said, that man's a drug addict. If you begin to open your eyes and you begin to understand and you begin to see the spirits in the spirit realm, you can begin to see and the Spirit of God will reveal to us what spirit is on people. I was at Sam's the other day. I walked up and I was... Uh, in a certain aisle, and a gentleman kind of come up behind me. It was like uh, he was tailgating me, only I didn't have a rear view mirror to see it. He kind of pulled up beside of me, and the Spirit of God said, this man is a Christian. And I asked him, I said, do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? He said, Absolutely. We live in a world when we should be able to see spirits and recognize the spirit is on other people. If we're not able to recognize the spirit that is on other people, when somebody comes into a room and everybody's laughter just... We should be able to recognize that a spirit has walked into the room that is not a good spirit. When other people walk into a room... That seems like that everybody in the room begins to be uplifted. We should recognize what that spirit is. Have you ever met somebody? Or do you, do you know somebody that you just really hate to talk to them because you know it's not going to go well? That's the spirit. Today we're looking at the spirit of Christmas the spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit of salvation, the spirit of joy to the world. The Spirit above all spirits, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is the coming one, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Did you hear that? In the Old Testament... <laughs> <clears throat> several hundred years before the birth of Christ, it's revealed to us that Jesus is coming. The Lord himself will give you a sign. I pray that you recognize the sign today. I pray that you stop resisting the, the power and the love of Jesus Christ today. A virgin. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, Luke 1, 34 and for 35. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Jesus Christ is holy. He is the Son of God, the everlasting Son of God the ever-present, the ever-being ever spirit, the, the holy Son of God, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. How, how else can we talk about him and lift him up? I want to lift up Jesus Christ this morning. This is what this whole time of year is about. 
Our merchants have made it about money. That's why we have Black Friday. It's about money. This is about Jesus. This is about the God that created this world. This is about the son of that living God. God spoke it. God planned it. Jesus spoke it. And the Holy Spirit did it and keeps it. Jesus Christ is a son. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He has always been the Son of God. Can I say this too many times? Are you tired of hearing me say it? Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the God who created this world. He is not Allah. He is not Buddha. He is not Hare Krishna. He is not Jehovah's Witnesses. He is not the Mormons. He is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. A name. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus Christ was with us from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1, 1. Jesus Christ has been with us pre-incarnate up until he was born of a virgin, a son. Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the triune God. In the very first verse of the Bible, then we see Matthew, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And Jesus has been with us in the presence since them incarnate. He was the very existence of God. He is what Isaiah saw in the temple. He is the one that Isaiah saw. He did not see God the Father. God the Father is a spirit. We might see a part of the glory of God, but we see mostly Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He is the one that Isaiah saw high and lifted up, and that his train filled the temple. Hmm. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Matthew 1, 21, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus Christ is the one who saved us from our sins. It's because he was born of a virgin. The celebration that we now celebrate, which is Christmas, we are celebrating the birth of, of Jesus Christ, where he came. He left the glory in heaven to come and be born of a virgin. He submitted himself, very God, submitted himself to becoming a human, to become a little bitty baby born in a <clears throat> stable, in a lowly atmosphere, the whole point of Jesus, he came as a servant. He came as a suffering servant. He came to suffer and to bleed and to die. He was punished and bruised for our iniquities. The scripture says, for all have sinned and they fall short of the glory of God. Exodus 20 verse 3 says this, Let's, let's make this point about we've all sinned. Amen? 
Can we agree with that? Exodus 20, verse 3 says, Do not have other gods before me. Many, many people this morning have another God before them other than Jesus Christ. Many, many people have stayed home from church to be with anybody other than the church family, to be anywhere except to be here and to praise Jesus Christ and to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Many, many people who call themselves Christians stayed home from church today because this is Christmas time. We got to get the Christmas dinner ready. We got to get the turkey and the ham and the, the peas and the carrots and the broccoli casserole with cheese and crackers. We got to get the asparagus ready. We couldn't have Christmas without asparagus. We got to get the oysters in the dressing. I mean, those oysters cook up and they taste really good in dressing. We got to get the mashed potatoes. We got to have a pot of mashed potatoes. We got we to gotta get all of this ready and we don't have time to go to church. We don't have time to honor the Son of God that died for us. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live a long life in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Have you ever disobeyed your parents? Have you ever stuck your tongue out at your parents? Have you ever had your parents give you some instructions and they turn and go the other way and you go, <laughs> Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the earth. <laughs> Have you ever hit your mother or father? Yeah. A lot of people have, don't want to answer that one. Have you hit them with your words? Have you ever said to your mother or father, I wish you was dead? Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the earth. Do not murder. Have you ever been so mad at somebody that you just felt like you could just kill them? Well, Jesus said if you've had those thoughts in your heart, you've already done the act. Do not commit adultery. Well, I've never committed adultery. Well, what did you think when that guy, you saw that guy on TV? I mean, what did you think when you saw that girl on TV? Or that girl walking down the street? Jesus said if you've had thoughts in your mind, you've already committed adultery. If you have lust in your heart, Do not steal. You ever stolen a pencil? You ever went to the bank and picked up a pen and just carried it out with you? Have you ever just took a piece of paper? Let's get down to the very small things. You know, those, Jesus said, if you're faithful in the small things, God can trust you in the big things. Do not give false testimony about your neighbor. Have you ever told a lie? Did you take that pencil? Well, no, I didn't take that pencil. What's that in your pocket? Uh, well, how did that get there? Do not bear false testimony. Do not covet your neighbor's house. Man, I... We, we, we take Christmas time, and a lot of people want to drive through the neighborhoods. Somebody's got a jillion lights in their, in their lot and on their house and in their front yard, and, and that whole street has a jillion lights on it. Everybody's got tr lights. Well, the whole neighborhood starts driving through there. 
man, you look at those houses and they're so pretty. They're so perfect. And they've spent probably $10,000 getting their lights ready. <laughs> and you said, man, I wish I lived here. I just, man, I could just, I can just see myself in that house. Man, I need that house. I, I think, you know, do not covet your neighbor's house. Have you ever done that? Have you ever lied? Have you ever committed adultery in your, in your heart? Have you ever been disobedient or hateful to your parents? Do not covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's husband. It used to be when I was a kid, it was the men who were always out of line. Anymore, it's just as much women out of line as it is men. Do not covet your neighbor's male or female slave, his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Do not covet. Do not lie. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Honor your father and your mother. Do not have any other gods before you. Well, if you've done those things, what does that make you? It makes you a sinner. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Trying to help somebody else to have the best Christmas this year that you've ever had. I'm not telling you all of this to make you feel bad. I'm telling you all of this to show you how important this birth of this Jesus Christ is for you today. This baby born in a cave. among the donkeys and the sheep and the shepherds. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This baby that was born at the time we call Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ at this time. This is the time we're celebrating Jesus' birthday. And... This same Jesus is the one who died on a cross and paid for our sins. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Acts 17.30 Repentance is a change of mind that agrees with God about my sin. That's that agreement with God when God says, Thou shalt not lie, and thou shalt not steal. That lie you told, the, the many lies we have told, the things we have stolen, makes us guilty for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. So we now agree with God about our sin. Well, then we have to agree that Jesus died in my place, this Jesus that was born of a virgin, this Jesus that was perfect here on earth, this Jesus that is the son of the living God, this Jesus died in my place. He became my substitute on the cross. I'm the one who deserved to hang on the cross. Bob Rogers, I am the one who deserved to hang on the cross. I was guilty of sin. It was me who was guilty, but Jesus took my place. He hung on a cross. He knew my name when he was on that cross. He knew your name when he was on that cross. It is that Jesus who became our substitute, the baby, the infant. Jesus paid my sin debt so I could inherit heaven. It's not automatic. In other words, just because you're alive doesn't mean that Jesus is already your Savior. It's not automatic. There's something you got to do. You got to believe on Jesus. Acts 16, 30 and 31. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved in your household. If your whole household believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
as their personal savior. If they really just, for the first time, they understand that they've got sin in their life and they know they need a savior and they they realize that this Jesus, this baby that we have having Christmas about is the one who died on the cross. When we realize that this is the savior of the world, this is a Jesus we need to believe in. This is a Jesus who made it possible for us to go to heaven when we die. When we can believe in that, when it becomes a part of us, when we be- and when it's something that we just know that we know that we know that this Jesus, this baby Jesus, is the one who was on a cross, who died for our sin, who did that so that we could go to heaven. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, But as many as received him, to them... He gave the right to become children of God. Nobody is a child of God until they receive Jesus Christ. When you open your arms and embrace Jesus Christ into your life as the Savior of the world, then you have the right to be the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Have, I'm asking you a question. Are you born of God this morning? Have you believed in Jesus Christ? Have you made, put him on the throne of your heart? Luke chapter 18 and verse 13, but the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Now let me tell you this morning, those who have seen God in heaven, those who have seen Jesus Christ, when they see them, the conviction immediately hits they really begin to see their sin. They see the awfulness of things in their life. Do you see the awfulness of things in your life today? I pray you do. We prayed early that Satan would have no ability to hinder your seeing this today. We prayed this as we begin this message. We prayed for you, wherever you are. Whenever you're hearing this, whatever land you live in, we prayed for people all around the globe. Are you willing to make Jesus Christ the Savior of your life today? Are you willing to believe in him? Have you seen your sin? Have you understood that that sin separates you from God? Have you understood that Jesus, this baby, is the one that died on the cross to set you free today? I pray you have. I pray there are those who have opened their heart and their life to Jesus Christ What do you do now? The first thing is of Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. It's time. Time is short. Jesus is coming soon. It's time for us to look on the bright side. It's time for us to be happy. It's time for us to celebrate that Jesus will soon come. Jesus is on the way to catch out those who trusted in him. 
Have you trusted in Jesus? When you do, if you've already done it, and you're watching this by Facebook, or you're watching this on YouTube, let us know. Or if you're watching this on our website, let us know. BethelChurchMinistries.org. The number is 270-804-1418. That's my personal cell phone number. Our church number is 502-354-1418. Nine zero seven two. Call us and let us know. We want to hear from you. We love you. We praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we come in Jesus' name to ask you to, by your spirit, move in people's lives. Those who are watching this, for no matter where they are in this world, no matter where they are in a time zone. Father, all around the globe, we pray that you would speak into people's lives. We pray that today is the day that this baby Jesus